December 22, 2021. A day that will live in infamy. Mark your calendar as the official day that the Matrix franchise died. After years of crickets, one of the Wachowskis comes back out of the shadows to make a movie so insultingly bad. I would argue it's one of the worst follow-up films ever created ever! And no, I'm not being hyperbolic. While yes, there are plenty of films truly atrocious and worse than this, the fact that it's a follow-up to such a beloved set of films, the first film being incredibly iconic, amazingly quotable, a truly touchstone moment in not only people's lives, but in cinema itself, as it would shape the way action films are produced going forward. So when this pile of crap dropped into theaters a couple years back, and on HBO Max, now rebranded Max because stupid naming conventions, I was super excited to see it, even though in the back of my mind I thought, you know what, Adam, this is probably going to be bad. It's been too long. People have moved on, done other things. Some of them are completely different people. I got my buddies together, rounded them up, the same dudes I sat in line for hours to watch the other Matrix movies in theaters day of fun, and we went to this one. And not a single one of the four of us had anything nice to say about the picture. And I saw nothing but a sea of disappointed faces. Confusion run wild as we all exited the theater, wondering if the Matrix could ever recover from such a pile of shit. So I red-pilled up, watched this thing on Max to see if it was as atrocious as I recall. And guess what, fam? It's actually worse. It somehow managed to be worse on a second viewing. Today, for the next 20 minutes or so, depending on how frisky I feel like being, I'm going to be going over this movie from top to bottom, front to back, and everything in between, roasting the living hell out of the Matrix Resurrections, the Matrix rebooted, the Matrix rebranded, the Matrix ruined. And maybe you'll agree with some of the things or all of the things I have to say. And if you like this film... That's fine, you might not want to settle in because it's going to be a rough ride for you. But here we go. Let's enter the Matrix. Resurrections. Before I shoot myself out of a cannon on this thing, I want to give a tip of the fictitious hat to Brian Davis. He's an awesome channel supporter, and he's a patron at patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies, where he gets access to hundreds of exclusive videos, including several monthly vlogs. What a time to be alive. But what a true treat this is. So that's a possibility for you as well. Otherwise, you could just subscribe. That's free of charge. It doesn't cost you a dime. And you can hear me talk honestly about all sorts of movies every single week on the channel. All right, let's begin. We start out on a positive. The first scene of the movie looks like the Matrix without the greens. The hues are gone, but that's kind of fair. I'll give them a pass on that because at the end of the Matrix Revolutions, they did reset the system. It rebooted again and the sun was made a little bit brighter. Everything was a little less huey in the news. Everything was a little less Huey Lewis in the news. They got rid of the greens. So that, that actually is canon. It makes sense. But it doesn't really make this mesh visually with the other movies. It's already on its own, the ugly stepchild. What isn't so forgivable is how this movie is shot. There is a cheapness to it, a digital look to this one that the other ones don't possess. The older films look cinematic. They look like they're shot on film. They probably were. This one has that garbagey, kind of stage play vibe to it that I just can't stand. So the movie fires up with a small amount of potential. There's some intrigue here. We are revisiting a scene from the first film. The intro to the first film, as a matter of fact, where Trinity is in a room up in a hotel. The cops are down below. They turn into agents. Your men are already dead, gets said. It's iconic. It's phenomenal. Trinity kicks the shit out of some guys and jumps out a window. But this version's a bit different. We have a new character. What's up, Doc? Says Bugs, our new kind of protagonist for some of the movie. Kind of the first whole half. And then she mysteriously disappears for a while, comes back later. But she's pretty much forgotten about, which is fine because she's not that exciting or interesting. She does have blue hair, though, and that's kind of cool. That's something. 
that's everything really about her character. Anywho, she is checking out this sequence as it's playing out, and she says to her buddy, I don't know his name, it doesn't matter, no one else matters in this movie, Switch, Ajax, uh, Plug and Play, Dildo, Vibrator, I don't know what his name is, but she says to him, hey, there's old code mixed with new code, what the hell is going on? This isn't the same Trinity, and it's not, it's not Carrie Ann Moss, it's a different actress playing the part. And then our first big action scene kicks in, and it is sadly the best one in this pile of shit film. And it's not even great. Bugs is running around on the rooftops. She's in pursuit of Trinity, who's fleeing from the agents. We have some sound effects akin to the old films, but none of the bullet time. In fact, there is zero bullet time, at least in the traditional sense, in this movie. We have poor man's bullet time, Kmart bullet time. The agents start now going after Bugs once they realize she's there. She jumps out the window, which coincidentally I wanted to do as well, lands on a car. This is the best shot in the entire film, and it is a pale cosplay of what we had in the previous movies. She enters a keymaker's shop, which actually turns out to be Thomas Anderson's old stomping grounds. This is where he did his coding. This is where he started following the rabbit down the hole. But who do we have here? Morpheus. That's right. Well, Lawrence Fish? My fish is back? Lawrence Fishburne's in this film? No. He did not come back. Instead of the stoic, cool as shit Morpheus, we get kind of a laissez-faire flamboyant version. That's cool. That's different. Uh, why? What? This Morpheus is code put into an agent or something. I'm already at a loss as to what's happening in this film. We are 14 minutes deep and I already fucking hate myself for going through this again. As an aside, and there's going to be several of them during this rant slash roast thing that I'm doing, I was invited onto the Rotten Tomatoes YouTube channel, that's apparently a thing that exists, to debate some guy as to whether or not The Matrix 4 is good or not. They informed me off camera that several people wanted to debate the movie but couldn't because they didn't want to lose their presser. I am not fucking joking with you. That is something that a person admitted to me. They did not want to talk crap about The Matrix because they did not want to fall out of favor with Warner Brothers. I don't have any qualms about it. I jumped into that debate. I feel like I destroyed the guy. I went in hot. I left angrier. And he, at one point, had the audacity, and I've heard this from several people on different outlets, he had the cojones to say that the reason this movie is special was because Lana Wachowski wrote it in order to heal from a loss of a parent. Bravo. So brave. So stunning. My response to this statement was swift. It was simple. It was to the point. I merely said, listen... I lost a father at a very young age, but I didn't turn around and write a shitty screenplay to get over it. Okay, that is not an excuse. I certainly didn't write a crappy screenplay to a beloved movie franchise to bury the thing. All right, bury the parent, not your movie property. Anyway, we're back with Mr. Anderson. He's now a video game designer in this new version of The Matrix. And he's actually the most prominent, most well-respected video game designer on the planet. Because you know what he made? The Matrix. What? How meta? How profound? They had him become the creator of the Matrix within the Matrix. This was actually an idea a lot of fans had way back during the original run. Especially when Reloaded came out. There were a lot of theories saying... Maybe Zion is actually a Matrix inside of the Matrix. That would be pretty fucking cool. And then Christopher Nolan would kind of take that idea and run with it in Inception years later. But that was the idea. This is, I guess, kind of a way, a workaround to that concept, but done in the worst possible way you could imagine. Now, upon first inspection, Keanu Reeves still looks great in this movie, but he doesn't look like Neo. He looks like John Wick. Because he's currently part of that much more relevant franchise, John Wick, on like the third or fourth at the time, has the longer hair, didn't bother cutting it for this movie, didn't, didn't bother cutting it for the majority of the film. He goes to the coffee shop with his buddy and in comes Karen, aka Carrie Ann Moss, aka Trinity. 
she has been relegated to a soccer mom character in this movie, going to get coffee with the kids. Her husband's literal name is Chad, and her actual name in the movie is Tiffany. It's Tiffany. Hate myself for watching this again. Neo, needless to say, is into her, but he's afraid to go spark up a conversation. We're now jumping back to the office where Neo is getting berated by his boss, who is actually the new Agent Smith, new and improved, played by a different actor. Now, this Smith, no longer the foreboding, brilliant, maniacal, evil, sinister, sharp, cool as hell character is a Chad and he looks like a budget Ryan Reynolds from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. That's right, two Chads in this for the price of dumb. It's at this point in time where I have realized Lana Wachowski doesn't give a shit about this film. She's cashing a paycheck, she's getting in and out, maybe burn the whole place down behind her. And listen, we're gonna go on a second side tangent now because it has to be addressed. Last time I talked about this stupid movie and I kept referencing the director as she and Lana, instead of the original male version years ago, Larry or whatever the hell the name was, IMDb has her as Lana Wachowski. This person goes as Lana Wachowski, has a complete operation, looks like a woman, talks like a woman. Like, I don't give a shit about what your, you know, your preferences are or what you believe is the right thing and the wrong thing for a person to do. I'm just trying to respect everyone as best I can. So if you're going to go into the comments right away and be like, how dare you refer to him as her and blah, 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 blah. She is he and da, da, da. I don't care. I will say the Wachowski brothers have a pretty good track record with movies. The Wachowski sisters, not so much. Haven't made a good film. Come on, ladies. Give me something to work with again. During this office conversation, the movie does clip show callbacks to the previous three entries. Just straight up footage from those movies put into this one like a glorified clip show. And I guess it would be fine if it was a quick little nod or a look back in time. But this happens throughout the entire movie. Several minutes of callbacks dedicated <laughs> to the old footage. What the fuck? This is where the movie goes full-blown meta, as new Agent Smith informs Neo, who's just Thomas Anderson at the time, that Warner Brothers, who is the company they work for in the movie, it's so meta, it's so deep up its own ass now, yet it's so surface level with the commentary at the same time. Warner Brothers wants them to make a Matrix 4, as in the video game Matrix 4 but also the movie, see the, see the, wow, the parallels are striking, they're amazingly stupid. And so they have to push forward either with Neo's help, Mr. Anderson, or without. They'll find a way. And Anderson even says like, uh, I, I thought you couldn't do that without me. And Smith's like, <laughs> well, we'll find a way. We'll find a way. And so he's kind of, ha he has to, his hands are tied. Either he makes this movie terrible or he gives it to the studio to make terrible. What? Do you, do you see how flawed this logic is? There were people online saying how brilliant and how sharp this film is because Lana was able to burn down her own house and not let someone else do it for her. She went out her way, damn it. Oh, all right. You still made a shit movie and you put your name on it. Congratulations. I can't honestly imagine Warner Brothers making a worse version. They could have hired a competent writer and director to make something actually good. But instead, you came back and had to put Wachowski on this thing and just ruin it all. That's not brilliant. That's not sharp. That's just shitty. And there were a lot of people like myself who freaking love the original trilogy. Yes, I love all three of them at this point. Especially with all the crap movies are now, I can actually look back on them pretty fondly. Three is definitely rough as hell, but I can get through it. I can get through it. 
This, though, is just a whole nother level of terrible. The scene ends, but the commentary is far from over. We're now at a team huddle where Christina Ricci is for some reason present for this one time only. She seriously has 30 seconds of screen time. She's in and out, cup of coffee, gone. She supervises the team as they do a full-blown circle jerk about the past Matrix movies. Well, they're talking about the games within the film and what they represent. The rich story, the lore, what it all means, what it's a social commentary on. This is essentially a Reddit forum come to life. During this miserable montage, we see Mr. Anderson's popping blue pills constantly, trying to keep himself from waking up. Back at the coffee shop, Thomas takes the leap and asks Trish for a cup of coffee. They sit down together. They have a boring ass chat about the good old days in the video game. Tiff has this theory that Trinity's based off her because she just has a feeling about it. Maybe it's some suppressed emotions, some, some brain activity from a past life coming back to haunt her. And Neo, uh, you know, Thomas Anderson's like, yeah, maybe, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, maybe, I don't know, I'm boring as fuck in this movie. I don't have anything to do. It's time to go into side tangent number three. In this version of The Matrix, apparently video game graphics are so lifelike, they are one-to-one. -one. Thomas Anderson's developing the Matrix video game. This is the fourth game. The other three games are the other three movies that we've seen. So whenever they show flashbacks, whenever they show footage of the fucking game, it's just the movie clips. But it's supposed to be video game clips. They're the same thing. It's ridiculous. Why not just make him a director in the Matrix? Then showing movie clips from the past ones makes more sense. It makes more sense that way, having him be a director. And then it's just really is a true one-to-one -one comparison. I don't know why they went the video game route at all. Since Lana was hell-bent on pouring gasoline on her own franchise, what she should have done, since Neo in this is a computer programmer or whatever, a game designer, she should have used clips from the crappy Matrix games that the Wachowskis helped oversee. There was Enter the Matrix, there was the Matrix Online video game RPG thing. They should have gone and used, <laughs> they should have used the clips from the games. It would have been hilariously bad. And it would have fit right in with this. Back at the office, Neil gets attacks from Morpheus himself, who's hanging out in the bathroom. That's the appropriate place you want to meet your hero. Hey, I haven't seen Morpheus for a long time. How are we going to introduce this character again? Let's do a a brilliantly crafted, timeless, ageless shot of the floor where you see the foot step down and we're just gonna do a nice pan up till you see the stoic shot of him get revealed coming out of a bathroom stall. Morpheus tries to convince Mr. Anderson that he is in fact in the Matrix. The mirror starts to ripple, he tries to red pill him up. Anderson says no and just then a bunch of soldiers come in and start shooting the place up. We get another action scene. This one's far worse than the first, which is an impressive thing to already say, but it's true. Anderson's boss shows up, coming to the realization that he's actually Agent Smith. While this action scene unfolds, complete with terrible, shuddery, slow motion effects, I couldn't help but sit there thinking about how much I hate that I'm existing in this world, wasting my time on this pile of crap. I just, I was fuming watching this movie. I was steaming mad. Let's go on to side tangent number four. When I saw this film, I guess we'll call it, in theaters with my friends and we left and I was just a shell of a man who was already a shell of a man before going in. So I was like a shell of a shell, two matrixes deep, Inception style. I came home and it was late. The next morning, my kids woke up like Christmas, running down the stairs, ready to open their presents, but nothing was under the tree and it wasn't Christmas time. Well, actually it was Christmas time. Hey, regardless, Nothing was under the tree. Instead, the present I was supposed to give to them was whether or not this film was good. Because I had spent time with each child of my two, going through the Matrix movies with them. My daughter I started with, we watched all three of them back to back to back, three days in a row. We grabbed takeout, we grabbed food from Chipotle, we had a fantastic time watching them over lunch. Two years later, I did the same thing with my son. And it was an awesome experience both times. So this movie coming out lined up so well. Because my kids had both just gone through and watched these movies. And they were super pumped for the next one. And I was super excited to share my thoughts. So when I came down the stairs and they saw me and they're like, Papa, 
Papa, how was the movie, Papa? This, this is how they talked to me. My vision, which was looking down at the floorboards, barely came up to meet their eye level. I, I couldn't look at them directly in the face, into the eyeballs. And I just shook my head. I just shook my head disapprovingly. And that was all I had to do. And their reactions were honestly heartbreaking. They both just went, oh, okay. And then I said a little bit later in the day, hey guys, listen, I really didn't like this movie, but I am not going to stop you from watching. It's already available on HBO Max. You are welcome to sit through and watch this film for yourself. But my kids, for some reason at the time, foolishly respected my opinion. And they still, to this day, years later, have not even bothered thinking about the Matrix regurgitations. And I respect the shit out of them for that. <laughs> Just, I can't, even th I can't even talk about this movie. I get so pissed. When Smith shows up and he grabs his gun off the ground and he's kind of coming to the realization that he's back in a new shell... It also dawns on him that he used to be a different character. And so again, we get clip show of Hugo Weaving, the awesome Agent Smith, one of the best villains of all time. Not hyperbole. I believe that in my bones. You have Hans Gruber, Dr. Evil, Agent Smith. Those are my like top 10. The scene inexplicably ends with Smith shooting Neo, I think. And now he's on the couch with his psychiatrist, played by Neil Patrick Harris. NPH, we will find out, is not just a psychiatrist. He's, in fact, this new branded architect known as an analyst. I mean, analyst. It pains me to see my boy NPH in this role because this character sucks and he deserves better, but this is what we have to work with. Up on the rooftop, Neo attempts to jump to his death. I envy him. But Bugs saves the day. She's like, eh, what's up, Doc? My name's Bugs, because Bugs in a computer, but also Warner Brothers owns the Looney Tunes, and we're trying to bring the Bugs Bunny stuff back. Yeah, Acme versus... Oh, that got canceled. Come with me through this door. So she chronicles of Narnia's his ass through a secret wardrobe, and they end up on a high-speed train in Tokyo, as one does. In this version, you don't have to go through good old-fashioned untraceable landlines. You can just hit hot spots. You can... You can point to destinations like mirrors and whatever. I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The, the way they get around is mobile. It's more mobilized. They make their way to Morpheus's underground lair where they are, I shit you not, doing a clip show of the old films again. But they're supposed to be video game shots. Up gigantic on a wall behind them, we see greatest hits montages from the flicks. What is- I hate this movie so much! After more exposition, which this entire movie is, they head back to the train and another action scene takes place. This one arguably the worst of the bunch so far. Still no bullet time. A bunch more of that shuddery shit. Close-up fight scenes. Very little choreography. Very little coolness to any of it. The iconic black leather. The glasses. It's all missing. Replaced with really generic NPC characters. We do get an introduction to one new thing. Swarms. Swarms are when the machines take over an entire group of people, essentially zombifying them so that they can go after a target. Not a bad concept, but ultimately doesn't serve much of a purpose in the film. Finally, Neo takes the plunge through a mirror, red pills up, and he's reborn again in his fluid sack. Since this whole movie is a trip down memory lane, we're now in a white background again. Morpheus is there with his dumb chair, talking about what the Matrix is, re-explaining everything in a lot less exciting fashion. Then we get the dojo fight again. Finally, a cool hand-to-hand -hand martial arts action sequence. No! Absolutely no! Nothing of value is taken here. But we are going to get a glimpse at Neo's one attack that he's going to use for the majority of the rest of the film. And that's this force push Hadouken blast that he does. <clears throat> but keep in mind, Keanu Reeves looks like he would rather be doing literally anything else than acting in this film. He's putting in zero effort at all. And really all he's going to do from this point on is just go Ugh, and kind of block things with his hands. 
and wander to and fro, meandering from scene to scene, bringing almost nothing to the table. I've now hit the one hour mark of an almost two and a half hour movie. I am at this point looking for any pill in my house that I can take to make me forget this shit exists. To get out of his sack, one of the Sentinels saves him. It's a good Sentinel. There's good robots in this one. There's good machines. This one's name is Cybabe or Crybaby or who gives a fuck. I... I God, this movie sucks! It's a pet that they can give commands to. It's a friend. It's merchandise that maybe Warner Brothers could put in a package on a, on a shelf at Target and your dumb kid will buy, but no one, no one's doing that. Nobody liked this movie. They take Neo to the new human-machine hybrid city known as Io, and it's led by Jada... Keep my wife's name! Smith. She's an old woman now, and she's still a bitter little bitch, and she hates Neo. She was like, Neo, remember back in my day with you? I didn't believe you were the one. You suck. I hated you then. I hate you now. You're garbage. Not happy they brought you back. Blue hair girl, you're fired. You're demoted. Get the fuck out of my sight. <laughs> I believe there's a hero in all of us. That's right. We got her. We got Jada. Niobe's back, baby! And it's been a while since I've really celebrated this type of character, but what we have in our midst is a strong female lead! And for the Matrix franchise, it's about time! And sure, Trinity was in the past movies, and I guess some people liked her because she was smart, a kick-ass fighter, looked sexy, had flaws, was just, you know, a well-rounded, fantastic character. But we got Niobe now. And Niobe doesn't play, fam. Niobe tells you how it is. And so for the next, what feels like 32 straight hours, she's gonna walk Neo throughout the, the countryside, throughout Io, showing him the comings and goings of their little factory, their little housing, how things really work now that they've kind of joined up with some of the machines, they're working in harmony, they grow gardens, they had force fields and stuff. And she even gives us a chance to pour one out for fish. We see a statue of the old Morpheus Lawrence Fishburne. We have our fish up there standing proud, standing tall. But ultimately it was pride that killed the beast. He didn't believe that machines and humans could work together. He believed in the one. He wanted to stay behind at Zion or something. And they keep it kind of vague as to what actually happened to him. You have to play the video game to find that out or something. Who cares? Niobe doesn't have answers for everything, though. She is unclear. She's a little cloudy with the chance of meatballs as to why Trinity's being kept alive. Because her body was actually right by Neo's up in the pods. And keeping her alive, that's a bit of a flex. Because last time we saw her, she was impaled with about 13 tons of rebar. Metal going through all of her. And that was like the third time she died in that movie. Not a good weekend for Trinity. We will find out later that the machines humpty dumpty her ass and Neo's back to life. It took years of repairs, putting the flesh together, reconstructing the brain materials and whatnot. And this was all at the behest of the new analyst. I mean, analyst. And that's going to take us to the plot for the rest of the movie, which is to save Trish. Free her mind. In Vogue style. Free your mind! <laughs> Neo and his crew roll out, but they quickly come into contact with an old friend. The Frenchman, who's now homeless. And a hobo. Everyone in this movie's kind of a hobo. Neo, the Frenchman, the Frenchman's goons, those vampire guys, they're back for some reason. Even Niobe looks decrepit, wearing some old garbs. We are on fight number four. This is the worst fight yet, if you can believe that. Very little choreography to be found. They're fighting on top of wood structures. Things are breaking. People are going through walls. They get that subway section again from the first film. Done horribly bad this time around because just like everything else, it's worse. Agent Smith talks about how he's a free agent, if you will, able to kind of go wherever he wants, be his own man sort of thing. He's not at the behest or the control of whatever the machines are doing, which is nice. It is unclear as to why he has to kill Neo. 
it's a grudge or whatever else. It's just really not clear at all. And later on, I will just fall to the wayside completely. But for now, they're going to fight for a little bit, waste time until inevitably we get to the scene that matters, which is the meetup with Patrish. They can finally connect and be together again. But before it happens, NPH interferes, snaps his finger, and... <laughs> bullet time kicks in it's back but it's not this is just some horrible shit version of bullet time it's like you and your buddies going out and doing your version of it in 1999 nph is moving around it's like oh it's bullet time i figured it out i use your idea against you <laughs> Free your man in that big day. He then goes on an explanation bender, talking about how Neo and Trinity needed to be close but never connected because it makes the energy or the battery life or the, the machines or some the matrix even more strong. It makes it even more secure. It makes it so that their powers can keep the real sheep away from the truth or something. It's all stupid as shit. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, stand a little taller. We take a pit stop back at IO where Niobe is chewing out the entire team for going off script. Their mutinous behavior cannot stand. She looks at Bugs and says, eep, 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 eep. That's all, folks. Get the fuck out. That's right. Full blown Porky Pig's her ass. For some reason, NPH let Neo leave. I, I don't. I don't know why, but he goes and talks to the new Oracle, which is the little girl grown up from the Matrix Revolutions. Full disclosure, it is at this point, I am now scrubbing through the rest of the movie. I'm hitting fast forward through chunks of it. I can't do it anymore. I hate it so much. It's pure torture for me to sit through and listen to this dreck. I mean, I truly hate it. Legit hate it. I hate that people like it. I don't hate them for liking it, but I, I'm like, I'm just upset. I'm upset about it. I hate that it has a fresh... Rotten tomato score? Barely, but it's in the 60s, and that's fresh. The movie is just so unimaginably awful. The freaking awesome slick action's gone. The memorable character is replaced by generic garbage. That high-octane music, nowhere to be found. Memorable sequences like the lobby shootout, the burly brawl, the highway chase escape. There's so many freaking awesome scenes. Nothing in this movie compares to you. Nothing compares to The trilogy was an event in time and space itself. The first movie touched greatness on its cheek. It kissed it. This pile of dung, this useless excrement is a spit on the ground at your feet. It's a slap in the face. It's a handy without the finish which is maybe the most despicable thing anyone can do to anyone else. Pressing on, Neo makes his way to Frankenstein's Trinity and grabs hold of her. They touch. You got the touch. You got the power. And she wakes up fresh as a daisy. But now she has to make the ultimate choice. Does she choose Neo? Does she choose love? Or does she go back to her cushy care and soccer mom life with Chad and the kids? Well, seeing as we never saw Chad and we barely saw her kids in that connection, there isn't much of a sacrifice there. We didn't get to know her as a person, this new version of Trinity, so we don't really understand the sacrifice she's making at all. Her choice is mute though anyways because NPH is standing yonder ready to fire a bullet into her head. But before he can get the job done, Mr. Anderson, Agent Smith, shows up. He thwarts NPH, Neo and Trinity get away by doing some force pushing on the back of a motorcycle. Well, Neo's riding bitch in this scenario. Trinity's doing cool stuff, driving around. Neo's just going, just kind of playing patty cake with the air. Eh, I don't like it. Get away, bullets. I don't want you here. Eh. Shit, super punch, super push. After failing to get hit by several cars, I came back inside to finish this movie. The Matrix is literally throwing bodies at these guys as people are jumping out of windows, smashing into the ground, cars are blowing up, it all looks pretty terrible. At no point in time in this movie does Neo do anything remotely cool. He doesn't fly yet. It's gonna happen. <laughs> it's gonna happen. He does try and fails embarrassingly, so... 
But we're at the end of the movie now. Thankfully, mercifully, we're coming to a close. Our two lovebirds are up on the roof. The sun is rising. It's beautiful. It's spiritual. It's emotional. And they take a leap together, a leap of faith, a leap of love. But then the helicopter that's holding them up by an invisible rope that they took out digitally carries them up to freedom and safety as they're awkwardly suspended in the air, clearly held in place by a helicopter. <laughs> this Trinity hangs on to Neo because she learned to fly before he did. He still doesn't know because he sucks in this entire movie. She's great. She was always great. She's just even better now because she's actually the one. Well, she's actually the two. Two become one. Spice Girls taught me that. That's right. It turns out there's two ones the whole time. How dramatic. We end the film with Trinity and Neo finally wearing shades in their black leather fuck you movie. They swing by NPH's house in suburbia. He's just chilling out on the porch having a, having a tea or something. And he's like, what do you plan on doing? Rebuilding the Matrix as you see fit and doing whatever you want. I don't care, blah, blah, blah. And Trinity goes, no, I mean, yes, we are. But we also wanted to thank you for giving us another chance. Okay, I mean, their bodies are still in the real world. The machines could eventually kill them. I, what, what's the end game here? What are we even saying at the end of the day with this movie? What was the point of any of it? Well, nothing. That was established in the script when they said this was a heartless reboot, a heartless sequel, whatever it is, a requel. And fittingly enough, the final shot is our heroes flying towards the camera just like in the original movie. But this time, Wake Up isn't played by Rage Against the Machine. It's played by a girl band. Because of course it is. Because of course it is. So brave, so unique, so different, yet so much the same. Now, final side note, I heard that the original Matrix trilogy and this movie, of course, was always a trans allegory. That's what, that's what Lana said. This was a trans allegory the entire time. All the movies were. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> bullshit. But if you say so, I don't really care. That was the fun of the Matrix was talking to people about it, sharing ideas behind it, sharing the messages, the symbolism, all that stuff is fun to talk about. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a movie that works on the surface, who gives a flying fuck what's going on underneath the hood? I need the thing to look and work right functionally on its face, and this falls on it. I want to thank Brian Davis at patreon.com slash movies once again for making me relive this horror filled nightmare that I, I had to endure for two and a half hours plus write down notes film edit it's it's a journey that I never thought I would have to do again but here we are thank you for watching or listening or whatever you did with this rant roast thingamabobber if you want to hear more I have a whole playlist of roasts and rants on the channel I do movie reviews every week I do live streams every week it's an awesome time I talk movies 24 7 over here well no I mean in a matter of speaking. So I would love to have you stick around. Let me know your thoughts on The Matrix Retired in the comments below. Unless you liked it, then I, I just don't want to hear anything from you. <laughs> I'm joking. Whatever you want to say is fine. Please like the video. Subscribe again. I, I, I implore you to subscribe to the channel. Become a Patreon. If you really liked what I'm doing, there's a super thanks icon somewhere under the video. You can hit that and say, hey, Adam, I love this video. Thank you for saying everything I thought. Here's five bucks, here's 20 bucks, whatever you want to give, I appreciate. And hopefully, I see you next time. Take care.